1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52. If you have it, we can stand and read that together. First Corinthians chapter 15, 51 to 52. Okay? Let's read together. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Amen. The Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. You may be seated. We want to continue uh, teaching, escape hell. Um, the song just said a few minutes ago that uh, I'm a child of God. In his house, there is a place for me. Amen. Amen. A place that he went to prepare for us. So hell is not our place. Last time, I don't know, some of you may miss it, there was a video that we show about how the rapture will start. I want to try to touch two things quickly today. How will the rapture happen, okay? And secondly, who will be rapture if I get a chance to finish it, okay? Now, um, let's play that video. Um, it's, a, it's from the Left Behind uh, uh, series. Uh, the Left Behind series is not perfect, but... Uh, it's been done well. There's a lot of things there that's really following the Bible. I can say, according to me, I don't know all the Bible, but at least 99% of what I see in that movie is lining up with the scripture. So this video you're going to watch is showing uh, a scene uh, that really goes together with uh, what it says in Matthew chapter 24, 24, that just like in the day of Noah, that's what is going to happen in our time. People will be getting married. People will be doing this and that. Basically what uh, the Bible is saying is that life will be as usual. People will be just having a regular life. It's not going to be like you will see some strange happening in the heaven and then, you know. No, it's going to be normal life. People at the mall and boom, it happened. There will be people in the soccer field, boom, it happened. There will be people in the airplane, boom, it happened. There will be people in the church, boom, the members are gone, the pastor did not go. He's preaching in the chair. So, <laughs> so it's going to be complicated. I'm telling you, this thing is scary, you know. You have to be right with God, you know what I mean? Yeah, you can't just stand here around your mouth. May God help us, you understand? This is serious stuff, okay, because... That the decision will be done by the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who knows our heart very well. Nobody can hide. Okay? So please watch this scene and then I'm going to continue with the scripture.
She'll be okay. Huh? Mom. She still wears that necklace, you know. Oh, I made her. She never takes it off. They're going to be all right, right? Mom and Dad. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Dad just got called into work. There's nothing you could do, okay? Did Dad tell you about my game? Are you kidding me? You're all we talked about. He said that you were the greatest baseball player in the whole world. And you know what? What? He's right. <laughs> I love you. That's too bad. That just happened because the driver is, is gone. There were two in the car, just like Matthew chapter 24 says. Two will be on the bed, one will go, and the other one will stay. Two in the car, one is gone, the other one stayed. Drivers that are gone, so it created traffic. You can stop the video there. Probably one day we'll have a movie where we can watch the whole thing. Now, this is not some sc scary tactics or whatever uh, for you to accept Jesus. No, this is Bible. Okay? They made this movie according to the Bible. Okay? For the most part. Uh, always in the movie you add something to make it, but the key is the message is there. When you read Zechariah, he talks about the day of the Lord. He says, it's not going to be a pretty day. It's not going to be a pretty day. Unfortunately, we are living in a time where scriptures say that people would like to hear things that are sweet in their ear. They want to hear things that, that people telling them, oh, it's going to be just fine. It's going to be fantastic. Oh, we just, God wants everything to just be great. Now, God delights in the prosperity of his children. But his ultimate goal is for you to have permanent peace, permanent joy. And that permanent joy is not in this earth. It's when you enter into his presence. Hallelujah. Now, if you understand 1 Corinthians very well, and 2 Corinthians as well, these are letters. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. If you read chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, from verse 1 till verse 5, I believe, you will understand the context right away. There's someone from the family of Chloe who goes to Paul and he tells him, he says that these are the things that are happening in the house of God. Paul was the apostle of that church. 
He established a lot of churches. But even though he established a lot of churches and put pastors, leaders, he was always in contact with them. So this person comes and he says, this is what is happening in the church. That's not gossiping. He was giving a report. Okay? So as Paul gets this, he writes a whole letter correcting the problems of that church. Okay? They have a problem of division. He tells them that some of you are for Paul, some of you are for Apollos. Neither are uh, both of us die for you. Jesus died for you. In the other way, the solution is be for Jesus. Don't be for Paul, don't be for Apollos. Don't, don't, don't hate us, but be for Jesus. They have an issue of immorality. So he addressed that. He said, mark those who are creating trouble among you, confusion and things like that. Put them out of the church. He said, I heard among you that the immorality at the point that even a man goes out with his father's wife. That's just a, a, a better way to say goes out with his mother. You understand? Worse things were happening in the church. But even though bad things were happening there, this is a church that is also gifted. Gifted because it has also the issue of uh, the spiritual gift. In chapter 12 of First Corinthians, it says, concerning the spiritual gift, do not be ignorant. Okay? So he addressed that issue. It means that where the presence of God is strong, the enemy also comes and fight right there. You know? The problem with the body of Christ today, when there is one or two incidents in the house of God, you see people panic. Oh, in our church, this is happening. This and that. We're talking about First Corinthians here. This is Jesus just recently gone. Paul is starting his ministry. Peter and others, they're still preaching. Okay? And the power of God is so strong in this church, but yet bad things are happening. Hallelujah. Oh, should I say hallelujah there? Okay. Hello? Okay, good. <laughs> now, the thing, the key thing is what? The key thing is it just shows to us the nature of the house of God. The house of God is not made up with perfect people. It's made up with people that God is perfecting. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say to your neighbor, God is perfecting you. God. Yes, God is perfecting us. So we have two people who are baby, who are drinking milk. We have people who are teenager, spiritually. They know everything. You know, teenagers know everything. You can tell them nothing. You have those people. You also have mature. And then the scripture teaches that those who are strong, they should support the weak. Okay? So don't come in the church and expect everybody to be perfect. Come in the church and know that somebody can insult you in the church because that person is just being perfected. They're not correct yet. You understand? Okay? All right. When your child, he do uh, number two in the cloth, you don't run away from them. Do you? You actually go towards them. When your baby messed up the diaper, you don't run away from the baby. You don't say you're no longer part of the family no more. No, you don't say that because you did this. You go to them and you clean them. Hello? Uh -huh. You clean them, okay, and you fix that. That's the mentality we need to have in the house of God. There are people who do something foolish, but our responsibility is to correct them. So first Corinthians, to make the whole story brief, is that Paul is trying to correct and direct them because he knows that all of them here, they're still in the journey towards perfection. Okay? Christ will say, uh, he will present us faultless. It doesn't mean that we are faultless. He will present us faultless. Okay? He will present us faultless. He's working on us. Okay? Through his word. So when you, got, you get to chapter 13, it talks about love, okay? Being the excellent gift. You go in chapter 14, it's talking about order in the house of God. Because there were confusion. You know, like I'm preaching, somebody you want to stand up, he said, the Lord is speaking to me. They want to prophesy. Okay? And, and, and somebody you want to sing a song over there. You know, it's like, hallelujah. And the pastor is preaching here. And the other one says, pastor, wait, 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 I have a question. Eh? Eh? And then the other one, da, 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 da. Paul said, hold on. If you have a song, 
sing a song, let everybody else listen. If you have a prophecy, then the, so he had to bring order in the house of God. Okay? Now in chapter 15, you have a doctrinal problem of resurrection of the dead. Okay? So some people are arguing about Jesus Christ. Was he resurrected in the body or not? Some say when Jesus was resurrected, it's just his spirit that was resurrected, not him. So Paul is addressing and explaining to people that, no, people saw Jesus. They ate with him. They saw him physically. They recognized him a little. Okay? He was with some disciples in the ways to, uh, um, how do you call it, uh, uh, that's, that, that road? Emmaus, yeah. He, he came to them in the house and dealt with them. He spent 40 days of his life after resurrection spending time with his disciples. So he was physically resurrected. And also he was raptured physically. People saw him. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Okay? So now he's addressing the issue to say that, listen, if Jesus was, if the resurrection of the dead did not happen, it means that Jesus also did not resurrect it. That means that our faith is in vain. Why? Because the only difference between our belief and any other belief out there is that Muhammad is still in his tomb. Confucius, Buddha, and all those people, they're still in the tomb. But we are the only people that claim that our Jesus is not in the tomb. Is not in the tomb. And that's the evidence because that can be demonstrated here and right now. Because Jesus is alive. When you are alive, you continue to do things that you used to do before. I'll give you one example. The difference between Christianity and any other religion. If you dare go to Malaysia, for example, in a Hindu temple and insult the gods, okay, Murugan, uh, what's the, uh, Ganapati, you dare insult, you're going to have a problem. The people in the temple, the Hindu can come to your house and burn your house. You do that in India, in Sri Lanka, you're going to have a problem. If you make up a cartoon insulting Muhammad, you know what's going to happen to you. They will track you down. They will destroy you. But if you insult Jesus from morning to night, nobody's doing nothing to you. Because our God is a God who defends himself. Amen. When you're dead, other people have to defend you. But when you're alive, you have to defend yourself. And he's able to defend himself. That's why a resurrection of Jesus is very essential in our faith. It's true, and it makes the difference. Hallelujah. Amen. It still changes people's life today. And he defends himself. You insult him all day, you burn the Bible, whatever you want to do, nobody, no Christian is going to come to you. Why did you burn the Bible? Why did you insult Jesus? No. Jesus is going to come to meet you in the midnight. You'll be crying like a baby. You'll become a Christian. Amen. Yes, because he's alive. Yes, you can clap for that one. Hallelujah. Amen. How Jesus is alive. Here I can say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. So now, because Jesus resurrected, we will also be resurrected. That's what he's trying to say. So he's talking about resurrection of the dead, but also at the same time, he's talking about the rapture. Okay? Now he said that I will tell you a mystery. Okay? Mystery is something that we don't understand. Okay? But God has helped Paul through revelation to understand. So now he's sharing with us. He said, I will tell you a mystery. So in the mystery, the first thing he's telling them is that there are people who will not die. They will see the coming of the Lord. Okay? They will not die. They will see the coming of the Lord. The fastest way to see the Lord is to die. Okay? You're outside of the body, but present with the Lord. Okay? That's the quickest way. But he's saying that, I'm not saying go kill yourself, okay? Don't do that, okay? No, I was trying to go quickly. No, wait. Wait for your time. You still have a mission to fulfill, okay? But he's telling them that there will be people who will not die. Now, when Peter, uh, uh, Paul is talking about this thing, he literally believed that it could happen any time. Because they were living also in the last days. The last day begin when? 
when you read Acts chapter 2, verse 17, you will see that uh, Peter responding to the people who were saying that they were drunk. He said to them, he said, in the last day, the Lord shall pour his spirit in all flesh. He's quoting Joel chapter 28. Okay? Now, he's saying that whatever you are seeing today is the fulfillment of what the prophet Joel has prophesied. Which means that the last day start the day the Holy Spirit came down. The last day started. The church began. Okay? So, with the same desire and hope and belief that they were waiting for the coming of the Lord is the same thing today. Okay? That's why I preach you about death before I did this. Because somebody will say, it's been 2,000 years. My point was that if you die today, then that's your last day right there. You understand? So you have to be prepared as you are waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Also be prepared that any time if he has to call you home, that you die in Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Are we, are we following? So now, second thing he said, in the twinkling of an eye, everybody move your eye like this. You see how quick is it? I don't know how many milliseconds is that. Or, right? Now listen. It's going to happen quick. Just like you see in that video. Boom! It's gone. Quick. He said a trumpet shall sound. Scripture talks about the last trumpet. The seventh trumpet in the book of uh, uh, Revelation from chapter 8 to chapter 11. Actually, uh, I did some research. It occupies 16% of what uh, the, the book of Revelation is all about. That's a lot. The trumpet. Okay? So it's very, very important. One day we're going to study just the trumpet. But this is about the last trumpet. The last trumpet will do what? What is the purpose of the trumpet in the Bible? Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 6 talks about to, 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 to son of man, when you see something bad is happening, tell the people, warn them. Okay? An announcement is warning and alert and the trumpet is also uh, an invitation. Okay, he announced a war. Okay, yeah, it's also an invitation. But in this case here, it is an invitation. An invitation to what? An invitation to come to the wedding. Which wedding is that? The wedding between the church, which is the bride, and Christ, who is the groom. Hallelujah. Are you now blessed that you are married to Jesus? Okay. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, the Bible says, For I am a jealous, no, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For, be, be, for I, be, I, I betrayed you to one husband. Hold on. I returned you to one husband so that to Christ I may present you as a pure virgin. Okay? So, there is a wedding that is going to happen. When I'm talking about wedding, I'm not talking about physical wedding the way we see it. It's just talking about relationship coming together of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, and the church. Okay? Revelation chapter 19 verse 7 talks about that again. Say, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. Him with big H. Jesus. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and the bride has made, has, has made herself ready. I got a question for you. Are you being ready? Are you making yourself ready? Okay. The church has to get ready because there is a time coming very soon that is going to be the time for marriage. Okay? Let me give you another evidence here. When you read in the book of uh, uh, 
Revelation chapter, not Revelation, Matthew chapter 22, 10 to 11, talks about the, the, the invitation to the wedding. Remember that? And somebody did not have the proper clothes, and it was thrown outside. Okay? What wedding is Jesus is talking about? Again, it's this wedding here that is going to happen after the rapture. Okay? The church will be gone. And when the church is gone, what's going to happen is that the church will meet with Christ in the earth. Okay? Let me give you a scripture that talks about that. First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 to 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will arise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet with the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with him. So the location of that wedding is what? The air. A place that he has prepared for us to celebrate this wedding. So when the trumpet shall sound, what the scripture is teaching us is what? That the dead in Christ shall rise first. Who is the dead in Christ? Remember in the beginning of this teaching, I defined those things. Because I told you we're going to need it. The, the dead in Christ are people who, when they died, they were believers in Jesus. They've given themselves to Christ. So when we talk about the bride, the church being the bride, we are not talking about change the nation church. We are not talking about Westover Church. We are not talking about First Presbyterian Church. We are talking about the Universal Church, which is the church that Jesus Christ himself is the head, is the pastor of that church, is the together or the assembly of all the saints in the world. Everyone who have given their life to Jesus Christ belong to that church. And guess what? Jesus Christ is the only one who knows all the Chinese who belong to that church. All the Koreans who belong to that church. So we can be here thinking that we all belong, 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 I mean, belong to the church. It is the day of the rapture that we're going to know who belongs to that church and who does not belong. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why, beloved, we should not play the fool. The invitation is open. He said, I'm knocking at the door, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. If you hear my voice and you open, what's going to happen? Me and my father will come eat with you. What is he saying? He's again talking about this wedding here, this relationship. This time we're going to spend together with Christ. And that's, that's just the beginning of us being with, our, with him forever. Because he said, we will always be with him. Okay? They said the dead in Christ will rise first. How are they going to rise? When the thieves say to Jesus, remember, I give you the contract between Jesus' message about death before the cross and Jesus' message about death after the cross. You remember that? Before the cross, they were away at the bosom of Abraham. The, the poor Lazarus, right? After the cross, I mean, at the cross, what Jesus did? He said, tonight you will be with me, not with Abraham, with me in paradise. Are we together? So it means that the cross has redefined where people go after death. Okay? They're going to paradise. Okay? The spirit is there. Okay? But the body has been done what? Buried. Okay? The spirit is in the presence of the Lord. But the body has done what? It's buried. Okay? Now, Somebody will argue and say, how that is going to happen, resurrection is going to happen for the people that have been burned. 
because nowadays they're burning people. In India, a long time ago, they used to do that. Now it's a becoming a culture everywhere because we don't have a, a lot of space to bury people. Right? Yes, they will still resurrect. How? Ezekiel 37. What do you see, son of man? Dry bones. Very dry bones. But when he said prophesy, when he prophesied, that voice that came like a trumpet, the wind came. What did he do? Put it together. They came bone by bones. Even if they throw you in the water, you will come back alive. They burn you, they bury you. When the trumpet shall sound, if you had Christ in you, remember that the sign of Christ in us is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Christ in us. He said, I'm going, but I will come to you. How did he come to us? Through the Holy Spirit. And he said the Holy Spirit is what? A seal. A seal, when you, you put a seal, it means that it's there. The Holy Spirit did not come to you to leave you. He come to you to stay with you. Yes, it can be said because of some things that you did, you did, you did was not correct. It can be disappointed in you, but it's not leaving you. Amen. It's right there. A seal. Okay? You can quench him when you are not listening, but it's there. Those of us that were, have accepted Jesus Christ and they are filled with the Spirit of the Lord and the Spirit of God is in you. Guess what? The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead will do what? Let's read it. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. The Bible says, But the same Spirit, the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Dwell where? In you. He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body through the Spirit who dwell in you. Okay? Let me just read all these scriptures so I can explain one time. Philippians chapter 3, 20 to 21. But our citizenship in heaven and from, from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus, who will transform our lonely body to be like his glorious body by the power that enable him, even the sub subject, all things to himself. Okay, which power is that? The Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is in the people who died in Christ. And the Holy Spirit is in you. Okay? When Jesus died, the scripture teaches that he preached the dead, right? So, when he was preaching, his body was laying there. Hello? It is his spirit. Remember, you are body, soul, and spirit. The real him inside was doing all that work. Okay? He was doing all that work. In your hands I lay my spirit. What happened? Was he there? Was he there? Yes, he's omnipresent. He's there too. So, is the spirit is there, but the body is what? Laying down there. After the third day, I mean, after, uh, on the third day, as he was predicted, what did the Holy Spirit say? Get up. It's time. I told the people that you will resurrect. If you don't come out, our trinity is gone. Nobody will believe in God anymore. Get up. The spirit of Jesus get back in his body and he come out. Right? And he left. Some people say they put the stone there to prevent Jesus from coming out. That's true. And the angel came, moved the stone. But the angel did not move the stone for Jesus. The angel moved the stone for people to come and see. Because Jesus, in a glorified body, did not need the stone to stop him. The proof is that when he came to see the disciple, what did he do? He showed up. The door was closed. He showed up. So the stone couldn't stop him. The stone was not removed for Jesus. The stone was removed for you and I. 
Because in the glorified body, there is no limitation. And because of the glorified body that Jesus had, what happened? He was caught up in heaven. He was talking with people, and then the look is no longer there. He disappeared. Because all the limitation that we have in this body here, we don't have it with the glorified body. That's why Paul said, I will teach you a mystery. We will all be changed. This mortal body will change to the immortal body. The glorified body. There will be transformation. This body here will not see God. The body you put makeup on. I'm not saying don't put makeup on. I'm just saying. The one you spend a lot of money for. Will not see God. Invest in the one inside. Hallelujah, church. Let me give you another scripture here. This is proof again that Jesus is the wife of the church. I mean the husband of the church. Husband, love your wife. Ephesians chapter 5, 25 to 27. Husband, love your wife just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he may sanctify her, saying, cleanse her by the washing of water with the word, word of God, that he may present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she will be holy and blameless. Hallelujah. So the church noun is doing what? As I'm preaching you the word of God, what's happening? God is preparing you. He's watching you. He said you are already holy because of the word that I've given to you. John chapter 15. Okay? So as you are coming to church, as you're reading the word of God, as you are praying, what is happening to you? You are being prepared. You are being made ready. Just like Esther, before she could go in the presence of the king, they took her and she was in a particular place. And Madokai was telling her how she's supposed to clean herself. How she's supposed to put herself ready. The same thing. Today we have Madokai. Okay? Pastors are playing the, way, the work of Madokai. And telling the church, listen, walk in righteousness. Because the clothes you're going to have to wear at the wedding is, me, is called righteousness. Walk in the fear of God. Live in sanctification. Live this way. The work that we are doing is doing what? It's clothing you with righteousness. It's preparing you so that when you march in front of the king, the king is going to look and say, wow, this is the woman that I'm looking for. Amen. Hallelujah. That's why we cannot afford to be preaching you messages of materialism. No. Time is so dangerous for those kind of things. You need to be made ready for the real stuff. Because when the real will appear, the fake will go away. Hallelujah. And the real will appear very, very soon, my friend. Hallelujah. Very, very soon, the real will appear. Let me finish with this illustration here. When you were a kid, did you play with magnet? Uh, how many of you play with magnet? You take a magnet, a big one, and then you put the metals or small magnet there. Which one pulled the other one? The big one. I wanted to demonstrate, but I didn't feel no magnet here. In Congo, you're walking on the street, you see magnet on the floor. Kids are playing with it all the time. Okay, so you have magnet and then the, it's going to pull the little one. Okay? Christ Jesus is the big magnet Amen. who stand. Not everybody this time will see him. It is when he's going to come back with the church. Okay? Before the reign of 1,000 years, that's why all eyes will see him. This time for the rapture, no, not all eyes will see him. Only the people who are going to be raptured will see him. 
he will be there as the big magnet. Okay? They say the Lord himself will appear. Okay? He will be there. And then what happened? The trumpet, the angel will go, Amen. Hey. And then the Holy Spirit will tell my mom, Miss Shirley, all the people who have passed away, get up, get up. You don't belong to the tomb. Amen. Just like he said, Lazarus, come forth. They will hear the name. Get up. And they wake up like in the sleep. The body, the spirit that was in the presence of Jesus come back in the body and change to a glorified body and they'll be caught up first. And then Christians who'll be in the mall at the church and different places at school and, and explaining mathematics and, and Brother Stephen will be teaching accounting and Papa Leon is giving order, measure like this and this and this and that. Boom, gone. You change and you're gone. And then when you come, Peter is, and all this, they'll come welcome and say, okay, come on, come on. And they'll say, you sit here, you sit here, you sit. Now here the where I have a big argument with theologians and with many pastors. They say that we will be there singing. So I said, when you go to the wedding, are we, is the, wed, the, the guy Mary singing? Or we the one who coming to the party we sing for them. When you go to the wedding, there is a big table that is different than anybody else, right? Where the husband and the wife will sit. Yes or no? Is the wedding the, 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 the groom the bride and the groom serving people? Are they singing? Or we are the one coming singing for them? Yeah, we are the one marrying. So the angels are the one who will be singing. We will be in the honor. Big table. We sit down with the king of kings. The husband of the church. And the angels are serving us. Uh, you can drink fake wine here. I will drink the real one in heaven. Made in heaven. It's going to be right there. He said, I'm not going to eat with you this Lord's Supper. You remember the Lord's Supper? Here again, but I'll eat it there. I thank God why Jesus eat with the disciple. Because it's an evidence that even with the glorified body, you can eat. Amen. Which means that when we go over there, we're going to eat. Because it's going to be a party. We'll be dancing. We'll be praising. You've never seen dance. You will see. You see an angel really breaking it down. You're like, wow, angel can dance like this. Yeah. It's going to be a celebration. It's going to be beautiful. But are you going to make it? Now, this is the, 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 the dangerous part. Because the only reason why the devil is not able to do what he really want to do on earth here is the presence of the church. Amen. We are praying. We just pray for the children. Everything he was planning to do this week with these children cancer because we just prayed. You understand? Now, guess what? When the church is going to be gone, who's going to stop him? Nobody. Say to your neighbor, you don't want to be here. You don't want to be here. You got to be rapture. Hallelujah. Very important. We must be rapture. Okay? And the question is, who will be raptured? To be continued. <laughs> All right, let's pray. I want you to pray for you. You can stand up, please. Pray for you. Pray for the person next to you. Pray for the names you give that we're going to, they need to give their life to Jesus. Okay? Three prayers, quickly. Let's pray, wherever you are, pray.
On to the man I surrender to him I If you sing, you know it. Sing it for me, please. Mm -hmm. I surrender. I surrender. Oh, to the man, blessed Savior. I surrender. Oh. Lord Jesus, your word you have given to me, I deliver unto your children. I pray that that word will be like a water that will clean our hearts and prepare us to be spotless, blameless when the trumpet shall sound. Let us hear our name and let us be caught up. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.